Multi hazards. All about the community. Welcome, Vin Nelson here with the Multi Hazards Podcast. And this is where we take a deep dive into issues that are facing society today with a special focus on emergency management, climate change, adaptation, the environment, human rights, etc. And the overarching theme here is protection, protecting communities. So dear listeners, it's my habit, my custom here, my tradition on each and every podcast to pronounce a territorial acknowledgement out of deep respect for the First Nations people on whose land I live and podcast from here in the suburbs of Vancouver, BC, Canada. So the text here is coming from the neighboring Kwantlen Polytechnic University or KPU. We work, study, and live in a region south of the Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiamu, Sawasin, Kikite, and Kwikwetlem peoples. So my guest today is Dr. Margaret Heffernan. According to her website bio, she has produced programs for the BBC for 13 years. She then moved to the United States, where she spearheaded multimedia productions for Intuit, The Learning Company, and Standard & Poor's. She was chief executive of Information Company, Zion's Own Corporation, and then ICAST Corporation, And she was named one of the top 25 by Streaming Media Magazine and one of the top 100 media executives by The Hollywood Reporter. The author of six books, Margaret's third book, Willful Blindness, Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Peril, was named one of the most important business books of the decade by the Financial Times. In 2015, she was awarded the Transmission Prize for a bigger prize. Why? Competition Isn't Everything, and How We Do Better, described as meticulously researched, engagingly written, universally relevant, and hard to fault. Her TED Talks have been seen by over 12 million people, and in 2015, TED published Beyond Measure, The Big Impact of Small Changes. Her most recent book, Uncharted, How to Map the Future, was published in 2020, and that is the topic which we'll talk about in this podcast. Now, Dr. Margaret Heffernan is a professor of practice at the University of Bath, lead faculty for the Forward Institute's Responsible Leadership Program, and the American company mentors CEOs and senior executives of major global organizations. She holds an honorary doctorate from the University of Bath and continues to write for the Financial Times and the Huffington Post. So let's listen to the interview then. So hi everybody, we're here for another episode of Multi Hazards and today we're talking with Margaret Heffernan about tackling uncertainty. So hi Margaret, it's uh, great to see you and you're all the way, I think you're outside of London or some city in the United Kingdom right now? That's right. Hi, Ben. It's really great to be talking to you. I am in deepest, darkest Somerset, which is about 100 miles southwest of London. Okay. Beautiful Uh, English countryside in the spring. That's wonderful. Yeah. Spring is here. So I just want to, first of all, congratulate you on this Uncharted book, because I don't know how I saw it in the beginning. I think at the Surrey Library, where I live, it was on the uh, recommended shelf. So I thought, hmm, let's have a look at it. So I thought, hmm, this is exactly what I needed. And this was <laughs> back during the second wave of the pandemic here around, uh, say, November last mm-hmm. year. And then I noticed online, I, I Googled your name, and you've been a guest on so many podcasts, and you've done so many YouTube interviews just about this one topic. And I thought, wow, this book is, it must be a hit. And I really wanted to thank you also, because it was a hit, this book, in my heart during that pandemic, because um, actually, we're in a worse wave right now. We're in the third wave. And with all these variants, it's, it's, it's getting worse. But 
emotionally, I don't know why I'm feeling much better. Maybe because I read your whole book cover to cover during the second wave. So it made me really think hard about so many personal and uh, societal issues. So I, I just want to thank you for this book because uh, it's, uh, it's, I don't know if you'll write better books in the future, but to me, this is your, what's the Latin word, the opus uh, grande or whatever they say in Latin. You know? The magnum opus. <laughs> oh yes, mag magnum opus. Okay, so I ask all the, the guests the first question. It's just because we're in an, what they call unprecedented time. I'm just wondering how you've been coping throughout this crazy pandemic. Well, I suspect I've been coping a little better um, than some and a lot like many, which is, you know, I'm very lucky. I live in the countryside, so I have a lot of very, I have a very safe place where I can have a lot of freedom. But I think, you know, like many people, um, occasionally the whole thing becomes kind of overwhelming when you confront the reality of what we've been through. And I have a sneaking suspicion that we won't really know what it's done to us until we're some distance from us. And, and when that will be, I don't know. Right. So, you know, I've remained very productive, very busy, um, definitely had my moments um, of gloom and despair, especially, you know, when I think of of the terrible conditions in which, you know, people are losing their family members. And also moments of gloom and despair when I think about what the future looks like to young people who really feel they've had their future stolen. Um, but for the most part, because, you know, as you know, I'm an optimist, um, I have these, these moments when I look down and think, oh, yikes. Uh, but then I kind of lift my head and keep going and and I find a lot of reward in the work that I do. Right. That's uh, that's so wonderful. And I love all these podcasts and YouTube interviews you've been doing because you're you're really hitting this issue at so many different angles. So, yeah, this book, it's basically about uncertainty. And a couple of years ago, I was studying climate change and I never used the word uncertainty in daily life, but in that field, they're using it all the time, uncertainty, uncertainty, uncertainty. So you came along and just made a whole book looking at this <laughs> issue from so many different angles. So I'm just wondering at the crux, how would you define uncertainty? Yeah, well, there are a couple of things that are important. Uncertainty is different from risk because we can quantify risk. You can't quantify uncertainty. And things that are uncertain are things where you have quite a lot of information, but not really enough to plan. So for example, the Bank of England will say that there will be banking crises in the future that they're confident of, but they don't know where they will start, what will trigger them or when they will start. Um, similarly, as you say, with climate change, we know that it's real but we don't, it operates in a way that we can't predict which forests are going to catch fire, which agricultural uh, crops are going to be flooded, um, where mass migration will suddenly be triggered by extreme weather events. So it's almost the worst of all possible worlds because we know enough to be anxious and not enough to plan. And, um, and so it's not just being you know, unconfident, it's not just having doubts, it's sort of knowing, being very clear about some things, but not having the detail we need to figure out the perfect response. And of course, this makes us deeply anxious, but if the gist of my book is that it does not leave us helpless. Right. Now, I'm just wondering, is there something special that happened to you or some revelation that you received in the last two years to to make you want to discuss these issues? <laughs> um, no, I mean, this book came about very much as, as other books of mine have come about, um, which is certain things kind of stuck in my head. And the first was a completely trivial off the cuff remark that a friend of mine made and she said, you know, if I knew I was gonna to live to be 95, I'd drink more. 
<laughs> and I thought this was really funny, right? Because I thought it's such a paradox, right? Because if you did drink more, you probably wouldn't live to be 95. But I just exactly. thought it was funny. And it stuck in my head. And then various in, on various occasions, for various reasons, people would ask me, you know, what's going to happen about Trump or what's going to happen about Brexit here in the UK? And I kept thinking, why are they asking me? Why do they think I know? Why do they think anybody knows? This is unknowable. And so all those sort of very small things uh, started me thinking about how do we think about the future? What are the kind of mental models that we use? And at the same time, I was very conversant with Philip Tetlock's research, which showed that um, you know, if you're very, very, very rigorous in forming questions and doing a lot of deep research and constantly upgrading your research with new information and assigning um, probabilities to your forecasts and constantly checking how good you are at this, you know, if you do all of that, which let's face it, most of us don't do, mm -hmm. then probably the furthest out you can see is 400 days. And if you don't do those things, as most of us don't, then probably the furthest out you can see with any degree of reliability is 150 days. Now, I have, I really like nerdy data points like that, because I sit there and kind of chew on them. And I thought, well, almost every organization I know has a five-year plan or a three-year plan. And I know some which are required by law to have 30-year plans. And if the furthest out we can see, if we're really super forecasters is 400 days, then the way we're working is completely inappropriate to the times that we're in. Right. And that's when I started thinking, okay, so what that means is everything kind of has to change. And if it all has to change, what does it have to change to? And, you know, by then I would kind of, I kind of knew I was onto something as a subject. And so I spent a lot of time, you know, studying the history of forecasting from the Greeks onwards and went down a lot of rabbit holes, right, from which I eventually backed out. Um, and I thought a lot about um, this thing that people believe, you know, that history repeats itself, which it absolutely doesn't. And kind of why do we think that and why is it wrong? And then I thought about DNA, you know, people saying, oh, well, DNA is a blueprint. It'll tell you what will happen to your life. It's kind of become the 20th, 21st century horoscope. And why does that actually not work either? And um, and anyway, by then, you know, I was kind of committed. I was I was knee deep in a book. Okay, so I mean, seriously, you hit it with so many angles. I was I was just um, flipping through it the other day, and I thought, my God, it's just like <laughs> one person. I mean, you. It looks like it was a team of twenty people who just got yeah. on every issue there. So yeah, one I, one person and no research staff. Right. Right. <laughs> right exactly. Now I'm just wondering. It, it seems that at least in the media that people quantify uncertainty. Like some people will cast it as something really bad and then mm -hmm. other people might put a positive spin on it so i'm just wondering can uncertainty necessarily be bad or good well i think it's both um i think that the good thing about uncertainty is that it also represents possibility so think about it this way if on the day you were born, you knew for certain every single thing that was going to happen to you, you know, where you'd go to school, what you'd study, what your grades would be, who your girlfriends or boyfriends would be, who your life partners might be, what your job would be, when you'd get promoted, if you get promoted, when you get fired, whatever, if you knew every single thing that was going to happen in your life. So 100% certainty. How would that make you feel? Well, I think it would make most people feel absolutely trapped, right? This is just, you know, it's your life, but you're the passenger on a runaway train. 
So we like the sense that we have a say in what happens in our life. We like having a sense of autonomy and agency. And in fact, what uncertainty gives us is the opportunity to make our choices and to define ourselves. So that's the positive face of uncertainty. The negative face of uncertainty, of course, is that much about it makes us very anxious. You know, we're deeply uncertain about when the pandemic will end, if it will end, and how it will end. And, you know, there's no way getting around it. That's really unpleasant. You know, I would love to know, do I get my summer vacation in Italy this summer? I would really love to know, um, when can I travel back to the US safely? And it's both inconvenient and because I have friends and family in America, you know, sometimes quite painful that I just don't know. So there's much about, and, and it, you know, when you come to something much, much more important really, and you think about the agonizing uncertainty surrounding how we're going to deal with climate change, you know, this is, this is terrifying. So uncertainty has these two faces and you can't disconnect them. You know, that's kind of the nature of uncertainty is this deep ambiguity and ambivalence. Right. Now, this is a kind of a side note. I didn't put this in our official questions, but I saw a Korean movie the other day. It was called Seobak. And mm -hmm. it had a theme that just blew my mind where there was this clone and he could live forever. It was mm -hmm. a cloned human about 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And so interesting. But in the movie, he knew and his um, fake mama who cloned him basically told him he's going to live forever. And it right. was just portraying the torture and the anguish that came just from knowing he's going to live forever, but nobody else is going to live forever. And everybody's looking at him like he's crazy. You should be happy to be living forever. You're never going to taste death. But to him, it was just, it was not a happy thing because at mm -hmm. least the other people, they could have stages of life and then they could, you know, move to their inevitable end and they knew that that would happen but for him it was just forever so I don't know if the, I'm taking this off in the wrong way but it just seemed that just him having that certainty that he's going to live forever was was not a happy thing and and I was surprised because mm -hmm. you think about the well, sort of youth that everybody wants to taste yeah well I would love to see the film because you know as you know there's a chapter in my book you know that called who wants to live forever oh yeah uh, and my and my answer is nobody right but um but you know i i interviewed this um kind of transhumanist or um sort of eternalist aubrey de gray who it was a, a big deal in silicon valley and who claims that he's finding ways to stretch life indefinitely and um you know and I you know personally, I think this is preposterous and obscene, and we have very, very, very much more important questions to answer and problems to solve than how to keep the super, super rich um, eternally youthful. But um, you know, one of the questions that that I asked him was, if you could live so long, don't you think you would become absolutely sort of weighed down? by your sense of loss. You know that, I mean, I'm not terribly old, right? But I can remember habits, etiquette, social mores, which, you know, frankly, I think were rather more elegant or kinder than today's. I can remember a gentler time. I can remember stores that are gone, restaurants that are gone, um, institutions that are gone and and you know that's a natural part of aging, but imagine hundreds of years of that. And and so I asked him, don't you think just this accumulated loss of people and places and behaviors and cultural norms would become intolerable? And he had no answer for it. He had no he had no understanding actually of what aging is <laughs> except a medical problem and so 
You know, I, I think this quest for eternal youth, which of course is, you know, it's, it's been true since, <clears throat> since humans, you know, discovered death. I think it's kind of understandable, but exactly as the film you describe suggests, you know, it's, it's not actually what we want. What makes life precious to us is that we don't have too much of it. And you see this in all the fantastic um, studies of aging, particularly those done by Laura Carstensen at Stanford, that actually, as we approach the end of life, people get happier because they cherish what they have left because it isn't infinite. And so, you know, I'm more than a little disdainful of the transhumanists and the eternalists who are devoting, you know, millions, if not billions of dollars to trying to produce technologies and products and markets um, in this quest, because quite frankly, I think they should take all of their money and address climate change so that people who are threatened by death now because of what we've done to the environment have no interest in eternal life at all. Right, exactly. Living till tomorrow is, uh, is their big challenge. It's their big hope and we owe it to them. And we really don't owe a couple more years of highly medicated, super sophisticated billionaire life. Exactly, exactly. Now, I remember reading in the book and there, you were talking about there are people and they make predictions. And they say, for example, oh, everything will be online shopping and all the malls will close and we'll all have driverless cars and oil will peak and then there won't be any oil left or AI will do everything or China will take over the world and the American empire will collapse. And these things are inevitable, right? Like, for example, <laughs> jobs will disappear. It'll all be robots. And when you hear about these things, you're like, oh, just getting freaked out. But you wrote in the in the very first chapter false prophets you said that all these things of course they're not inevitable right and i'm just wondering and you you hinted at it before just people making these statements of inevitability it's just it sounds so arrogant and maybe a little dangerous well it definitely is arrogant um but i think it's kind of worse than that uh which is i think it's propaganda Right, all of the enormous hype around driverless cars is aimed at a couple of things. First of all, it's aimed at boosting the valuation of the startup businesses that are investing in this new technology. It's also aimed at legislation to try to make sure that if or when this technology actually works, which it doesn't yet, um, that there are no legislative, legislative hurdles to overcome. So it's an attempt to kind of make sure that there is no public debate about whether we want this. There is no public debate about whether it's safe enough. It's really an attempt to blindside or dazzle um, you know, citizens and to build corporate interests and to soft sell legislators who may not be as well as informed as perhaps they should be. And, um, and there's no authority in it. I mean, I think Google promised us driverless cars in 2017, and they did so pretty much at the moment that Jerry Brown, the governor at the time, was signing into legislation all kinds of new laws that would allow them to pursue this. I mean, this is a corporate, this is corporate propaganda. This is not anything that any genuine forecaster would regard as serious prediction. And, you know, let's be honest, Silicon Valley has been famous for decades for hype and vaporware. And I've worked in the software industry, you know, for many years. And I suspect, you know, I probably produced a, some of my own, but we shouldn't take it seriously. I think every time you see a forecast that says this is inevitable, you have to ask yourself, who's trying to sell what to whom and why? because they're trying to stop you thinking about it. And they're trying to deprive you of a sense that you have any choice in this, either as a citizen, a consumer, or a member of a democracy. 
So I think, you know, at the silly end, it's just kind of laughable, but at the serious end, it's a real attempt to bully the public into submitting to things which actually, if you ask them, they quite likely don't want. So I think, you know, we've always known about advertising. We've always known about PR. And now really, I think the ugly face of PR manifests as um, phony forecasts. Right, exactly. Now you said before that history, it doesn't repeat itself. And people, we keep saying that it's like almost like a proverb in the English language. Now, yes. <laughs> for example, it, when you say that, it seems to me that you're saying, well, can we really grasp historical lessons from all angles, right? Or is it just every time we're reading history, it's, it's revisionist history, for example. And then the other question is, is our interpretation of that history so-called correct? And can we identify patterns? And will these patterns keep repeating, even though the circumstances are not repeating? So there's just a lot in that phrase where you said, history does not repeat itself. Yeah, and there are several reasons. I mean, it was really interesting because we had some very big arguments uh, with my agent on this because she kept insisting, no, no, history does repeat itself. Look at the invasion of Russia. You know, so I went and talked to, um, to historians who said, oh, no, no, you can't say that you, ca that you can never invade Russia. You know, the King of Sweden invaded Russia in whatever year it was, you know, and, and, and succeeded. Um, so, and what I discovered is the more I talk to historians is none of them think that history repeats itself. And the reason when you get down to it is actually quite simple, which is that um, if you think of a past event and a very close similarity in the present, we know about the past event, which the people in that past event did not know. So we have new knowledge. And therefore, we aren't in the same position. And therefore, we make different choices in the light of that knowledge. And therefore, the outcome will be different. So, for example, you know, the poster child for this being the, inva you know, the invasion of Russia, right? Napoleon tried it, failed. So it was inevitable that Hitler would fail too. Well, no military historian who knows Hitler's campaign in Russia well, we'll tell you that. They will say it's a series of forced errors, that it was much more Hitler's error in thinking that he himself was a great military strategist, that it's, you know, it was not inevitable. And actually there are circumstances in which he might very well have won. So, you know, so, so, we, so history doesn't repeat itself because we now know things which those at the time did not know. And I think one of the most really beautiful examples of this, which is in that chapter, is to do with the Northern Ireland Peace Accord. So there was a very interesting movement in Irish, in the study of Irish history in the 1980s, um, where Irish history went from being a kind of recurrent trope around the Irish always being browbeaten by the British and always kind of striving to come out of bondage into light, as it were. And a lot of really wonderful historians who were also very fine writers started telling Irish history differently. There's a whole series of contingencies where decisions might have been made differently and where actually at every moment that a decision was made, it might have been otherwise because nobody had the full information. And that therefore, actually the moment of decision has nothing inevitable about it. It has a lot of choice embedded in it. And this really, I think, and many, you know, many historians think, meant that when the opportunity for a peace accord came up in the negotiations in Northern Ireland, that instead of approaching these negotiations as one of inevitability and doom, there was a very different outlook which led to a very different outcome. And to date, you know, a very much more positive outcome. In other words, being able to think about the past differently, 
could create the possibility of a different future. Now that isn't inevitable either, but what it's really saying is that history is driven by what people know at the time. And what I will know tomorrow is different from what I know today. And so it's up to us not to surrender to this kind of doctrine of inevitability, but to think about what is it I know now that I didn't know before and how does that change the choices that are available to me? Right. And it's like inevitability, kind of, it's a bondage. I was just reading, there's a book by Heather McGee. It's called The Sum of Us. It's about um, racism in in America and how it has actually mm-hmm. hurt all the white people too over the last couple centuries. And mm. she was talking about unions and in several cities in the United States, there were these uh, movements to raise the minimum wage. And it wasn't just raise it, you know, a couple dollars, it was raising it to a living wage. And it was just amazing how they were telling people, let's do this, let's start this movement. And people who were in, for example, fast food industry, they just couldn't believe it. They're like, oh, you know, this industry has been like these appalling wages for so many decades. Like, how could we even strive? How could we even dream of something? But they actually had some successes. And I was wondering, yeah, this whole sense of history is inevitable. Whatever happened in the past will happen in the future. It kind of dooms us to, to, as you're saying, with this uh, peace accord with Ireland, it dooms us to strike out and try something new. Yeah. And I think it, I think in some cases, the doctrine of inevitability or the rhetoric of inevitability is selected for that reason, to take away our sense of choice and agency. Because exactly as you say, it leaves us feeling absolutely helpless. But indeed, in the fast food industry, there have been some real successes. And um, and I, I think that, you know, the minute someone says to me, oh, it's inevitable that, you know, my instant reaction now is, okay, what is it you're trying to take from me? What is it you're trying to persuade me of? But you don't want to have the discussion or the argument. You just want me to agree with you without thought. And that's not a very productive conversation. Exactly. Now, kind of along the same line is, is technology, because there's always these ads saying, oh, this is going to open up a whole new world to you. But I've seen from your writings, it's, uh, and I saw, I think in some uh, YouTube interviews, where you were saying that, that technology actually will take away some of our choices. Like, for example, if you visit a city and, you know, instead of just kind of wandering in the streets and having an adventure, you've got this travel guide or this thing online or this website and you have to hit these three hot spots before the end of the day or end of the week right so you don't explore yeah well I yeah so I think you know I I run technology companies so I'm by no manner of means um, a kind of full throttle luddite who hates technology and all Mm -hmm. of its um, forms but I think that we've come to, I think that over time, what it's done is it's given us a kind of neediness for certainty. So that, you know, if we're going, if I'm going to go to Barcelona, I can, you know, I'll research all the best hotels and choose one and the restaurants and book tables and the sites and book tickets, you know, and the walks and, you know, maybe book a tour guide or whatever. And And that can feel very empowering, except actually I'm just having a deeply generic experience of Barcelona. And the more we do that, because it's convenient and it reassures us, the less able we feel simply to strike out and explore. I mean, this is gonna make me sound super old, but I can remember, you know, driving to France with no hotel reservations, you know, just a map. And it's how I found some of my most favorite places. And so I think a lot of technology is a kind of trap, which is it offers of certainty, but what we don't see is the price we pay for it, which is losing our capacity to explore. And it's kind of interesting because in lockdown, 
um, I decided to buy myself a bicycle because I really wanted to get exercise mm -hmm. and be able to go out and to explore. I live in a very, very hilly part of England. So I got an electric bike. And um, and what I found I was doing, you know, I mean, I've lived here for 20 years, but I found I was getting lost a lot. And I found it was incredibly interesting. And because I didn't know exactly where I was going, because I didn't bring my phone with me, I noticed everything much more. And so as much as I think, you know, the smartphone has its place in our life, I also think we're becoming rather addicted to the certainty that it gives us. And that in many circumstances, like my daily bike ride, actually the richness of experience of not knowing exactly where I am is incomparably deeper than the convenience of knowing precisely the most efficient road, way home. And so I think that we have to be much more mindful of the fact that when we outsource work to technology, which is what we do, you know, when we go on TripAdvisor or whatever, um, we are outsourcing a capability or a skill, which if we don't use it, we will lose it. And some things I'm perfectly willing to lose. Like I don't know my children's phone number. I just pick up my phone and I hit their name and that dials them wherever they are. I'm quite happy not to have hundreds of phone numbers in my head, which I used to have. But I'm not happy to lose the capacity to talk to people, which is what, you know, AIs that kind of conduct conversations for you will ultimately do. I'm not happy uh, to have a child who learns to, you know, shout at Alexa and boss Alexa around and say exactly what they want. I'm not happy to bring up my child who thinks that that's a reasonable way to speak. So I think we just need to be very much more alert that every time you use a piece of technology, you're going to lose something, understand what it is and make a conscious decision as to whether that's okay. I'm definitely not gonna give up my smartphone and remember all my kids' phone numbers, but I am going to learn how to get around my region in the English countryside without my phone, without a map, because I know where I am. Mm -hmm. So maybe sometimes we need to rebel. Like, for Definitely. example, for example, job search, you know, we have like where I live, we have like uh, three or four websites. And that's it. You know, every time I go on those job search websites, I think, is that it? That's all that's available. Everything is starting at minimum five years experience. And you think about people dating, you know, on Tinder or yeah. whatever, and they think that's it. These are all the people. Whereas say 50 years ago, they go to the bowling alley, they go to dances, they go to outdoor movie theaters. There's so many areas where they could meet somebody. And it just seems that if we want to kind of break free of these job search websites or Tinder, that sometimes we need to just say, okay, I'm going to, um, just do it old school. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go talk to a stranger. Man, imagine that, you know. But I think the really insidious thing about the the kind of matching websites, and I'm not against them. I mean, my sister-in-law met her husband that way, and they're very happily married. But I think if that's the only way you meet people, then I think it's a problem because we all know that what they're doing is they're building a profile of you and matching it to somebody very much like you. And if the only people you ever meet are the people like you, then your capacity to deal with diversity in life, to deal with people who have a different perspective, which by the way, is where all the interesting interaction lies, your capacity to do that is, is nil. And it's quite interesting because last week I was teaching um, a class of MBA students about how to uh, manage conflict well. And I was really struck that they, you know, they're a very bright bunch of students, but their capacity to see an issue from someone else's perspective was extremely limited. And this hampered them in their negotiations because 
they couldn't find the common ground, right? Because they couldn't think, okay, here are my values, here are this other, here are this other person who has different values, but what do we have in common? I mean, they just couldn't distinguish between where they were the same and where they were different. And they couldn't even listen acutely enough to understand in any deep level, who is this other person? What is their otherness? Which is where the, the interest lies. And it's, you know, that what's different between you and me, Vin, is what we have to share with each other. But they were very poor at this. And it's one reason, you know, I love teaching this curriculum, but to the degree that we just hang out with people who agree with us, we're going to have some very confirmatory, but let's fa face it, rather dull conversations. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to be stretched and we're not going to be challenged and we're not going to be very creative because we're just going to keep recycling the same old stuff over and over again. Right. So exactly. that's one of the huge, I mean, this is very well understood that this is part of what the internet has done. Um, and I just think, you know, I don't think that means, well, all those, those companies should be taken offline. But I do think that if they're what you absolutely depend on, then your world is very small. Right. Now, you've written a bit about artists, I notice, and I've heard some interviews about them. And I think you also have an kind of a musical background or some kind of arts background. And you basically said that artists are better at handling the whole issue of unpredictability, et cetera, and uncertainty. So I'm just wondering what, what is the thing about artists that makes them special in this area? I think they have an unbelievable tolerance for uncertainty. If you think about it, you know, an artist makes work that nobody asks for. There's absolutely no guarantee it will turn into anything very meaningful. There's no guarantee anybody will like it. Uh, most artists, when they finish something, have absolutely no certainty about whether it's any good or would be at all successful. And very typically when they become successful, instead of just repeating themselves, they keep moving. So they quite often leave their fans behind because they want to keep exploring their own capabilities. So these are people who live mired in uncertainty and very productively so. And I've, you know, I've had the huge good fortune to work with a lot of very, very fine artists, writers, actors, directors, composers, painters. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm just endlessly staggered by the robustness with which they manage deep uncertainty in all aspects of their lives. So I think there's a lot we can learn from them. And, you know, the cliche of artists is that they're very childlike, which I think is just kind of um, uh, misunderstanding. It's that they're very fragile, which I think is completely wrong. These are the toughest people I've ever worked with in terms of their capacity to keep going in the absence of positive reinforcement. And I think one of their great, great skills is they are, it's like they're bristling with antennae. You know, the reason I wanted to write about artists was because they keep doing things that are ahead of their time. Now that isn't because they're predicting and it isn't because they're forecasting. They're just super sensors. They just pick up stuff and they do that often by simply wandering. I mean, in some cases, literally, right? So Chick uh, Dickens or Samuel Beckett or Virginia Woolf, you know, many artists just walk endlessly, sometimes at night, sometimes in the daytime. But what they're doing is they're just kind of looking and they're sifting through all the things that they see and they're thinking about very often on an unconscious level, what does this mean? What are their patterns? What do the patterns mean? And they create things that later really speak to us about the times that we live in, about the deep, deep themes underlying our lives. And I think there's a lot that we could learn from this, partly in terms of giving ourselves permission to do kind of unstructured 
noticing to approach a subject or a place without an agenda, without a goal, to let ourselves be sponges and then gradually see what our brains make of it, the sense that they make of it. And there's huge wisdom and creativity in this, but, um, but for the most part, we're so concerned to be efficient and to be on track and to be on schedule and to be right, that we cut ourselves off from some of the greatest richness, I think, in life. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you know what's funny? I know people always put the science, sciences and the arts pitting them against each other, but I've been doing some science teaching recently, and we've been looking at the periodic table. I was just surprised at how many of these kind of things about the elements have been discovered by accident or <laughs> it was just you know late at night and they weren't even looking for it and and they found it yeah. right it wasn't an intentional planned thing that came out from data it it was just kind yeah. of an ex accident i was thought well this is much like the arts yeah it is very much like the arts and you often find you know many many scientists have huge passion for the arts but I think there's there's something very important here, which is there's been a movement lately, possibly more in the UK than the US, but I think it's it's pretty general, widespread, which is, gosh, there's an awful lot of science in the world and it's all over the place and it's you know it's not really organized. And if we organized it, we could make it more efficient. If we made it more efficient, you know, we could get to the right stuff faster. Everything about this is wrong right everything about it is wrong i mean the you know the periodic table came to mendeleev in his sleep you know he didn't go to sleep saying hey brain come up with the periodic table you can have such a concept right you often don't know what you're looking for until you find it and of course i wrote a lot about how this plays out at cern the european center for um, nuclear physics what generates huge breakthroughs in science, and this is very well understood, is a kind of teeming ferment of not unstructured, but not planned um, activity by scientists worldwide. And that's a very big part of their job to know what everybody else is doing and to think about, okay, if that's what's true, then what else might be true? And actually it's a fantastic model of creativity. And yes, there's duplication. And yes, there are problems which, you know, you attack one decade and you can't solve it and you attack it the next decade and you can't solve it. And then suddenly one moment you can, but you can't always see those things coming. And so you have to invest in the ecosystem, not in the individual, not in the superstar colleges. You have to invest in the ecosystem as a whole or else you won't know what you've just lost. And this is very difficult for funding bodies to understand. You know, they want a guarantee that if I put my money in this pot, a Nobel Prize will emerge, but it doesn't. It just doesn't. And it's been really interesting, you know, watching all the excitement around the vaccines, um, which, you know, it is astounding. We've never before created vaccines for such a complex disease as COVID in such a short period of time. But the reason is, because since the post, you know, all through the post-war period, we've been investing in the study of Im human immunology in great depth and detail. And it is built, you know, each generation of scientists built, built on what has gone before. And what we're seeing now is not the fruits of one year, although that's the kind of Hollywood narrative that's being told. We're seeing the fruits of 70 years of science, right? The big golden age of immunology started in the 1950s. That's what we're reaping the rewards of. And anybody who thinks that Johnson and Johnson did all this work in a year, you know, and the people who think that aren't scientists, by the way, doesn't understand how science works. Right, now, Margaret, I think on some of the other podcasts, uh, you have talked about the pandemic, and you've also talked about youth. Now, 
and it's hard because like, for example, I'm moving into my mid fifties, but hoping to work another 20 years and retire like late as possible. But <laughs> I can, and, and I think about young people, it's hard to put ourselves in their shoes and say, okay, if I were in my late teens or early twenties, how would I see the future? But I think that they might feel super nervous now going through this pandemic and wondering what is this world going to be coming to and then we have to you know all focus on climate change again and there's just so many issues for example like um, racism and systemic um, problems like in many countries and so if you could put yourself in the shoes of young people and mm. what what would you think that are some possible avenues that they can um, go down yeah well, I think I have a lot of sympathy with this generation um, and a lot of compassion. If you think that the formative events in their lives have been 9-11, the banking crisis, the economic crisis that followed, Brexit, Trump, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter and climate crisis, these are the defining events of their lives in the first 20 years, right? For very good reason, they're not very optimistic and they don't have very much faith in us because we did this one way or the other, right? Mm -hmm. This is what our generation has produced. So this is, you know, this is a really difficult place to be. So I would say two things. I would say, first of all, that we, owe it to them to help, to mentor them, to give them access to our networks, to give them whatever advice and encouragement we can, to step aside when we can. I mean, I quite often try to give, you know, various speaking engagements or opportunities I get to younger women than myself. Um, we really owe it to them to give them a foot up on the ladder because from where they're standing, the first step on the ladder is above their heads. I think the second thing I would say in terms of how they need to think about it is I think they have to understand that there aren't really any guaranteed safe havens. So what they need to be able to do is to develop skills and passions that they really care about and can excel at and appreciate that they are going to spend their lifetime learning that what they're learning you know what they're learning in college today may be useful to them for 10 years maybe if they're super lucky 20 years they're all everybody's going to have to reskill everybody's going to have to find different avenues um and i don't feel gloomy about this and i suppose i I say that because, you know, I trained as a radio producer and then a TV producer, and then I ran tech companies, you know, and now I'm a writer and a teacher. So I think I've had four careers and I personally find that pretty exciting. But I think for young people, what it means is that life feels very insecure. And so I think having a few hardcore skills that can at least give them a little bit of financial security are useful but just keep filling your mind with more information, more learning, more experience. I mean, the way I think about this, which is a little banal is, you know, the more food you have in your refrigerator and your cupboard, the more options you have when suddenly 10 people turn up for dinner that you weren't expecting, right? And we're gonna live in an age of uncertainty and unexpected events. And the more knowledge you have and the more understanding you have, the more relationships, rich, deep relationships you have, and the deeper your really meaningful network is, the more choices you'll have. Now, this does not mean networks as in who can help me. It does mean networks um, that are about really understanding each other. And it does mean learning the kind of habit of helpfulness. And on this topic, you know, I think absolutely hands down the best 
book on that subject is Adam Grant's wonderful book, Give and Take, which, mm -hmm. you know, proves pretty much, you know, so beautifully that people who are helpful do better in life. And I don't think that's particularly the lesson that this generation has learned. I think that we've lived through an age of what I hope is peak individualism, where everybody's been encouraged to think only about themselves. And I think, you know, Adam makes a wonderful case that actually helping people is how you build re real relationships with people. And people are where opportunity comes from. Mm -hmm. So take your relationships seriously. Take your capacity for learning seriously. Those two things, if you keep investing in them forever, will enrich your life and enrich your opportunities. Right. Now, this is kind of my last statement here, and it's totally off the cuff. It's not in the list of questions, but um, this example is burning inside of me. Before, um, let me see, Bruce Lee, he was the martial artist, you know, from yeah. Seattle and Hong Kong. Yeah. He, his wife, I think, produced this, um, what do they call it, post excumulously uh, after he had passed. And okay. it was basically, she collected a lot of his notes on, on fighting and his philosophy of life. But I thought this was um, really interesting. He said that, you know, if somebody comes to hit you, then a lot of us will instinctively put out our hand and block the punch just by mm -hmm. nature. But he said, people go studying, uh, who goes to study whatever martial arts, they will study and study and study. And then you go to hit them. But instead of reacting, they're thinking, hmm, should I use the monkey block or should I use the <laughs> camel thing? They're just thinking too much. So he yeah. said, you have to move past to the third stage, which is taking your natural reaction, put it with your training and train so much that your natural instinct and your training kind of mixes together. And it allows you, as he says in, um, I think it was one of his movies or an interview, he said, be like water because water can become steam, it can become a liquid in a cup, and it can become ice. And I just thought that um, his example there is basically one of the um, analogies that you have about dealing with uncertainty. It's just like, we have to be like water because, you know, even water itself, if it had a brain, it doesn't know what the weather conditions are gonna be the next day. That's right. And, um, you know, and I think this is about being highly alert to your environment and, um, you know, very sensitive to small changes within it. But it also is about having a kind of reservoir of skills, knowledge and capabilities that you can apply when suddenly, you know, the water changes direction. So I think, I think you're right. I mean, it's a beautiful analogy that you know, that some of, some of the adaptability consists of both a lot of conscious expertise, but also a lot of unconscious creativity. And I think if you want a really fulfilling life in a very volatile age, you absolutely have to have both. And I think we tend to focus very much on the skills and capabilities without allowing ourselves enough experience kind of unbounded experience to, to cultivate the kind of unconscious awareness. And I think, you know, I think the great life, the fulfilling life absolutely requires both. Right, exactly. Now, I just want to say that this book that I have, I got it from the library again, and I've got it in my hands. Um, they should make a conference. They should make each chapter into a conference and get a bunch of experts and other people to talk about each topic. I just think that, especially now that everybody's talking about, um, are we going to get out of COVID? Is it ever going to happen? Um, <laughs> right. The, the, the post pandemic yeah. world, you know, it's funny. They were doing it last summer after three months of pandemic. And now it's like a year I later. Know. And it's like, um, how many years are going to, going to do post pandemic conferences? But I think this book should be the theme of a post pandemic conference honestly I just think that you've hit on something that that strikes a nerve so yeah. I, I just want to thank you for writing this and, and and doing what you're doing because maybe maybe it wasn't your plan but it's it just really uh, hits the spot for everybody 
Well, thank you so much. And thank you for being such a close and careful reader. It definitely wasn't my plan. I would have preferred that we not have a pandemic. But, um, but you know, it's, it's a really great thing to feel useful. And, um, and if the book is, is helpful to people, um, then that's the best reward I could possibly have. Great. Well, thank you so much for participating in the podcast day. And I'm sure my listeners will really be appreciating this. So have a wonderful week. Thank you for a great conversation, Vin. It's been a pleasure. Okay, take care. Bye bye. And that's it. This was an awesome conversation. Thank you to our brilliant guest, Dr. Margaret Heffernan, for participating in this multi hazards podcast. And a little disclaimer here. This podcast is meant to be educational and doesn't try, no, does not try to offer legal, medical, or other specific advice unless otherwise noted. And also the opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of the organizations that either me as the host or the guests are part of. So here as I conclude this episode, a special thanks to all of you, my precious listeners, for tuning in today. Stay safe out there and stay tuned for more. This is Vin Nelson wishing you the best on your journey of surviving and thriving with all that life throws at you. Cheers to you all. Peace out.